Asian and Asian American Studies Institute. And uh, we're uh, delighted today to have uh, Matthew Salas here. Uh, today's event was uh, generously supported by the Creative Writing Program and the Asian American Studies Institute. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have with us today Matthew Salas as, as an editor, writer, educator, and novelist. Mr. Salas is a, is a publicly engaged intellectual concerned with the intersections of race, adoption, and parenting. His novel, The Hundred Year Flood, from which he'll be reading, was, uh, has already won numerous awards, including the Adoptive Family's Best Book of 2015. He's also the author of I'm Not Saying, I'm Just Saying, and Different Racisms on Stereotypes, the Individual, and Asian American Masculinity, as well as The Last Repatriate. Mr. Salas shares his experiences as an adoptee from Korea on a number of public forums, including NPR's Code Switch, the New York Times, and the Center for Asian American Media. Uh, the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, Mr. Salas brings wit, insight, and creative prose to bear on difficult questions. When not working on his own writing, he's helping others with theirs at the University of Houston. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Sass. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. Th thanks, Jason, for that very nice introduction. Um, if there are people here from the departments, I'd like to say thanks for bringing me out here. I grew up, I was just saying, I grew up like a five minute walk from here. I used to kind of sneak out of my house and walk down here. Uh, and then like play on the crash mats. They used to like leave crash mats out all the time. I wonder if they do that anymore. We and a bunch of my high school friends would play football on top of the crash mats. It was our, our favorite thing to do. It was, it was a different time. <laughs> um, so I started this book in college when I was 22 and then it took me 11 years to, to write the thing. Um, but I was, or actually just after college, I was living in Prague, uh, teaching English. Um, and it was a great job. I, I just kind of would travel around the city and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with um, mid-level executives about, I mean, one person wanted to talk about flying an airplane. Um, and eventually I started just kind of moving the conversation toward what I wanted to talk about, which is a natural thing to do. Uh, and what I wanted to talk about was kind of the myths and superstitions of Prague. Um, because the longer I lived there, the more it was, it was just a place that seemed like constantly haunted. Um, and it was the city that was like continuously invaded, uh, and then the invaders would get into Prague, uh, planning to destroy the city, and they would be so struck by the beauty of it that they would preserve it instead, or they would make it some kind of home base from which to invade other places. Um, Hitler, at one time, wanted to, to make the Jewish Quarter in Prague his uh, museum to a deceased race. Um, and so this was kind of like, people were aware of that history all the time, and it was kind of in the air almost, that it was this, there's this sort of fatalism, um, but also sort of survival, uh, survivalism, I guess if that's how you would say it. Um, and I, I was going there um, to kind of get away from myth. Um, what I came to realize over a long time, over 11 years, was that you know, I had grown up just with a kind of myth of myself as an adoptee and, and like no facts about where I was born or who my birth parents were or kind of you know, all of the, the things that you carry with you in your identity. Um, and so I had to kind of take other people's stories about who I was as who I was. Uh, and I had gone to Prague really because there nobody knew me. And um, it's even more apparent than I wanted it to be that nobody knew what to do with um, an Asian American there. Right? But at a certain point, I kind of realized I was maybe the only Asian American in the city, uh, other than like maybe a few tourists and you know, actual Asians, Asians from Asia. Um, and so it was a very strange experience. And so I started this book then, and it took me a very long time to kind of 
understand why uh, these myths and superstitions were really speaking to me and why I kind of had made, had made a book out of them and then my experience. So I'm going to read a little bit from the beginning of the book, which starts out with a list of, of superstitions, and then um, just a slight bit from the from farther on. I think I'll just keep it a little shorter, um, and then we'll leave time for questions. So it's called the Hundred Year Flood. Before his father came and flew him back to Massachusetts General Hospital in September of 2002. These are the things T learned in Prague. One, if someone sneezes while you're talking, what you're saying is true. Two, if your nose is soft, you're lying. Three, if you cut an apple in half and see a star, it's good luck. <coughs> if not, it's bad. Four, if you step and chit, it's good luck. Five, if you pour molten lead into water, you can tell the future from the form it makes. Six, if your hand itches, you'll get into a fight. Seven, if your nose itches, you'll get beaten up. Eight, if you pour something and it overflows, someone you know will get pregnant. Nine, if you lift your feet for someone to sleep under them, you'll never marry. Ten, to cry at the wrong grave, that's the Czech expression, means to bark up the wrong tree. Eleven, often the legends of Prague have to do with selling one's soul to the devil. Twelve, half of Prague will be destroyed by fire, half by water. And 13, when the Czech Republic is in its most desperate hour of need, a sleeping army under the hill Blanik will awaken and defeat its enemies. T wrote this list during his first week in the hospital. He woke on a wet pillow and he scrambled over the railing of his bed and fell to the floor. He pinched his nose shut. Water brushed over him, thick and brown, but he could breathe. He stood and rested the back of his hand on his pillow. He cried to sleep again. He smoothed down his dry hospital gown and went to the window. The river outside was the Charles in Boston, not the Voltava in Prague. He pressed a sheet of paper against the glass, blocking the view, and wrote until the words blurred. When a doctor knocked at the door, he touched the bandage around his head and told himself there was no flood. He was in Boston. The doctor switched on the x-ray board and they stared at the back of T's skull. Where T had been hit, the nerves had fused together in shock, and the skin had knotted and died until a surgeon had to cut it off. T knew who had attacked him, probably. Someone T had called friend. He couldn't remember what exactly had happened. The impact had caused some rare brain damage. He couldn't tell dates or remember song lyrics. Are you listening? The doctor asked. He stood on one leg and the doctor tested his balance. The solidity of the floor shifted like weather. For the second time that day, he was back in Prague. He was running naked under the fireworks on New Year's Eve, the wind slapping his chest. People pushed and sang and embraced, and the back of a glowing leg slipped through the crowd. A woman walked out of T's hospital room, but no one had been inside except the doctor and T. T started forward, and his balance came out. The doctor held him up, linking arms, and called for a nurse. The doctor said he had to want to recover. He had seen that leg, that calf, before. Where? Later that month, he would transfer to a rehabilitation center, meant to reorient him to a world he'd never understood. He would stumble down the halls, searching for a ghost. He took to stopping other patients and prompting them with abstract nouns. They had to get used.
reduced to every kind of bewilderment. Love, you'd say, hands trembling, and someone willing might answer, what goes up comes down. Or, if you give a mouse a cookie. Regret, you would say. And someone might answer, a wish for a perfect life, or aging. Hate, you would say. And some would remember why they were there. So P leaves college after his uncle's suicide, um, which happens in the wake of 9-11. His uncle's a pilot. And at one time, I was kind of playing with this idea of like the collective unconscious and what would happen if you were like, in the air and you felt this kind of, I don't know, something mystical like that. Um, and he goes to Prague where he thinks no one, you know, where he thinks he can kind of be whoever he, he wants to be. And he uh, ends up kind of, on New Year's Eve, this was something that I experienced while I was there. They, there's this large kind of celebration, as probably most places. Um, down in the old town square, and people kind of shoot fireworks, not straight up, but like down the streets, like right over your heads. It's really quite frightening, or it was to me. Um, for somebody who wasn't used to it, it was pretty frightening. Um, and, and while I was there, um, a friend of mine, I have no idea why this happened, but he took off his clothes and kind of ran out under these fireworks in the middle of, you know, he's very American. <laughs> and, um, it was just a spectacle, and it stuck with me. And so he runs out on New Year's Eve, um, bears his body, and uh, is discovered by this um, artist couple who ask him to pose for them. Um, and so as he poses, he starts to feel like he has some sort of hold on or belonging in the city, some role, and uh, he ends up falling in love with uh, a wife. And, he lives in a part of Prague called Karli, which in 2002 was destroyed by this very large flood called the Hundred Year Flood, and that's where the book gets its title. So I'll read a little bit from later on. In August, in Prague, the flood would seem a surprise. Those storms came and went for weeks beforehand. Police and firefighters raised barriers along the embankments in Old Town, but left the Carling district unprotected. On the news, a former construction worker warned that buildings in Carling could collapse, built too quickly with unfired bricks. An analyst predicted deaths and lawsuits. The city surrendered its boundaries. Citizens defended museums and places of worship with sandbags, and the rain and evacuation was ordered, but people thronged bridges and riverbanks to watch. Sections of sidewalk buckled like tiny tectonic plates. Trees tipped over in the oversaturated soil and had to be tethered like barges. Metro lines were shut down, too late to protect them. The river washed parts of other cities into Prague, the river pulled down levees, then buildings. The river washed parts of Prague into other parts of Prague, and then into the rest of Europe. From where T watched, in his second floor apartment, the flood made a high brown sea just below his window. He smelled the sewage in the water. He wondered how he had let himself miss the signs. How strange. The way we wade into disaster, step after step, not realizing how far we've gone until we're drowning. Just before the flood, Katka had asked about Korea as the raindrops formed fat planets against the window pane. Her finger followed the streaks across the glass. A Korean friend told me once about his visits as a kid, he said. Everyone looked like him, but he still didn't belong. Katka touched her temple where her skin met her hair. No one your age, she said, feels like he belongs. How did she really see him? His quick black eyes, the scar on his chin that toughened his boyishness, his flat cheeks and curved nose, the cream in his brown skin, 
that seemed to make white people touch him without realizing. He was a believer, as Pablo Picasso had painted. In college, he had listed ambitions. Get a girlfriend, be a writer, drink more water, fall in love. He had believed in the kind of weight that could drag whatever fluttered in his chest down to more comfortable depths. A someplace or someone. Katka smoothed her hair and he said, you don't know what it's like to be adopted. People see you as who you were at birth, but you're not that person. At that point, the flood was still weeks off. He opened the window and caught rain in the cup of his palm. Katka pulled his hand in, and for a moment, he thought for some reason that she would lower her lips to the water and drink. She splashed his face. He pulled back in anger, but her grin conquered him. Thanks. story and more about um, 
critical thought or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and when I'm writing fiction, I'm, I'm trying to focus more on the story. And the other stuff kind of comes out of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're connecting with what you just said before about confusion. You know, like a memoir about confusion would be, you know, like you could, it seems like you'd be, do the more interesting thing with fiction. You'd be able to create these sort of loops and folding back on itself. Yeah, though I do find that, you know, like the, maybe just the way that I think about life or process life is always in those loops anyway, right? Uh -huh. um, one, one of the things I like about nonfiction is you don't have to make anything up. <laughs> you're, just, you're kind of making meaning. Well, okay, maybe you have to make some things up. But you're making meaning out of the things that have already happened, and you're trying to see, like for me, I'm often trying to see the patterns. Uh -huh. All these things have happened, and just now, writing nonfiction about them, writing an essay about them, I'm starting to see, oh, oh, maybe this is why it happened, or this is how something that happened 20 years ago links with something that happened a few days ago. Or something. Not that you can't do that in fiction, but you can, but yeah. you more focused on that. Well, just think of a novel. It starts out, and the person is and drinks too much alcohol in the novel in the first place. Well, but it's too young, and that person's going to have a car wreck. In nonfiction, the person may start out and drink too much alcohol, and that's it. The next thing comes up and comes up and comes up. So it's you could drift all over in nonfiction and tell the most incredible lies. <laughs> Just so long as you write it well enough that people enjoy reading. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know. That's going to be uh, <laughs> an aesthetic question. Not a question of whether they're true or false. It's a question of whether they work on the page. Yeah. yeah.
some reason when I'm writing, I never, I'm not really thinking, I'm thinking of people that I don't know, actually more maybe than people that I do know, um, are going to read something. And it, maybe because sometimes I read a bad book by a friend and then there's this little part of me that's judging my friend depending on the quality of the book, right? Um, or I'll read a, a great book by a friend and kind of, you know, I'll like them more, right? Um, and so I thought I have to do this, right? I have to kind of do the same process of looking at myself and understanding what of myself has gone into the book and what has been hidden from me, um, or what I've been hiding from myself. And so I tried to think back to you know, me as a 22-year-old in Prague, and um, I had this question asked of me many times by my editor and by my agent and by other readers of the book, where people would say, well, like, why Prague? Um, and I was, you know, when I went to Prague, I was 22, and I went there because I thought I had nothing else to do, and I wanted to get out of the country, right? There was bush carry, and I was tired of it. I wanted to get out. Um, and so I tried to think, like, when I was 22, what, you know, what was really going on there? What was I really doing in Prague? You know, the year after that, I went to Korea for the first time since my adoption. I had a, you know, z absolutely zero knowledge about Korea. Um, it wasn't like now. Like, there was a, people didn't sell kimchi in the supermarket and you couldn't listen to K-pop on the radio. Um, and so I had just zero contact. Um, and yet I went there right after Prague. And I started thinking, like, why, you know, why did I go to Prague first when a part of me was clearly wanted to go to Korea? Um, and I realized that I was, you know, what I was hiding from myself in the writing process was that I was hiding from myself when I was in Prague. Like, that's what I was doing. I was hiding from myself. Um, and I was hiding from my adoption. And so I, I had to rewrap the book in my final edits so that it, it brought that out more. And that this ending about adoption, and it, and it always seemed like the right ending, but I didn't know how to make it work until the very moment when I realized that the whole book was much more about that than I thought it was. Um, so yeah, I think that that continual process of, for me, that continual process of like knowing yourself better or, or being a better person, that's, it seems pretty closely linked to writing. Thank you. I pick up the book accidentally, oh. and this year I read it in Korea. I was, oh, wow. yeah, I was visiting it, so it was that time I'm, I'm here. It's so, but and you, picked up, you picked up the book in Korea. Yeah, it's uh, my actually my son, mom. Would you like to read this book? And I said, oh, and I knew of you. I don't know. It, you know, but so I know you were adopted and I read that book. And actually, that was my question. He didn't go to Korea, I didn't know you already went to Korea. So, he, why he went to Prague <laughs> of all this? Yeah. <laughs> and so, but I really enjoyed to read your book. And in the beginning, I thought that's it's just the myth that flood was just a myth in your imagination, but apparently it really happened yeah, in that great flood. <laughs> so yeah, I really enjoyed it, uh, the reading the book. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, the flood, floods have this kind of mythic, right, mythic place for us. Thank you. There's no other comments, questions. If I started the book later? Yeah, and like, even experience everything later. Like, do you think, how different would your story be? I think it'd be totally different, I, I guess. I mean, I, I think that the kind of, you know, these questions of like, who you are is always changing when, when you're trying to, when I'm trying to write, it's, you know, at the heart of that is some kind of grappling with that, right? Who I am, you know. Maybe not in such like kind of 
thematic ways, but um, part of the reason why I write is I feel like myself right, when I'm writing, or I feel like I have the freedom to be myself when I'm writing. You know? um, and so that's, you know, I don't know, maybe this reveals too much about me, but that for me it's like every day that's different. <laughs> you know, if I wake up tomorrow, I'm, I'm even hoping that I'll be a different person. Um, you know, not like vastly different, but little by little. Stepping outside of your experience or your uh, I mean, what's made you who you are so far, and, and the stories that have been told about you, right? Like, so um, a large part of it for me was this. Like I was saying, that there's, there's all these stories that are told about adoptees, and they were told to me too. And um, going somewhere else, on some level, it was to go somewhere where those stories didn't exist. Right? So then. But what I ran into, obviously, is like you just get more, you know, there are just other stories to be about it, right? Um, and the same thing happened when I went to Korea. I, I had this like weird thought that I would go there and I would smell the air and I would like touch the ground and like I, I was adopted when I was two and a half, so I thought like memories would come back or language would come back or something. Um, nothing did, obviously. But instead, what happened was I felt even more like a stranger, right? That I, I went there and I, Nobody saw me as Korean. I mean, they saw me at first, maybe just the first look as Korean, but as soon as I started talking, I was somebody else. Um, so I've been told my whole life, right, you're Korean, you know, and, and sometimes in those words and sometimes in less nice words. Um, and then when I went there, I was told, you're American. I never actually felt more American than I do when I'm in Korea. Um, and so that it, changed, it changes like how you're looking at yourself even because I mean, for me, it was like I was realizing how arbitrary those stories are, or that those stories aren't really about you so much as, as what you do, you know, how you uh, deal with those stories, right? Whether, how much you resist them, how much you own them, how much whatever, right? Um, and that they're different than any place that you go, right? They're just they're different in Connecticut than they were when I went to college in North Carolina. No, it's different as in Korea, but yeah, they're different. Maybe that's part of why travel can, can do those things for you. Yeah. Uh, for the time that you're writing the book, were you ever like thinking about just like not writing the book anymore and like saying like that gave you a doubt in what was going on? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yes, I thought you know, I thought on several occasions <laughs> maybe let's do something else or something, you know. Um, and I did actually come out with another book before this one came out. Um, because I started writing these, I, at a certain point I felt like, I really just need to do something that will finish, and that I can finish. And so I was writing these very small, like 100 word stories um, every day, just so I could do something that would end. Um, when I started sending them out, people really liked them. <laughs> and they started asking for more, like I had like, at one point I had, 20 of those stories, and, and, and a magazine said, can you give me 20 stories? And I thought, well, I, I have 20, and some of them are already published. So I had to write 20 more stories. And then um, what happened after that was a publisher asked if I had a book manuscript, and I said, I have 40, I have 40 one-page stories. And they said, well, how about 120 one-page stories? Um, and so I was doing this, and that ended up being my first book, that just trying to do something that would Done, like to make myself feel good, make my, like to get some kind of self affirmation. That's, yeah, I, you have to, I have to do something else. But I'm stubborn too, so like, I'm not good at giving things up. <laughs> process 
so what would I do when I invert this block? I mean, the process for me is, is pretty, like just on a kind of nuts and bolts level, like a day, day by day thing, it's pretty boring, right? Like I just get up and I try to make writing the first thing that I do because I know that if I let all the other things happen first, then I never have any time for writing. And if I do the writing first, somehow everything else gets done. Um, so I know that the time exists, but I don't know where it actually goes if I do it the other way around. Um, but it, it usually I kind of take some time, it takes me some time to get back into what I was doing the day before. So I'm reading over, I've written for a while. It takes a lot of headspace, I think, to write a novel, um, maybe differently from a story. And so I'm tr constantly trying to like re-access the part of me that was working yesterday. Um, and I just do that over and over again. I feel like that's a really boring answer. <laughs> No, I didn't go to find my birth parents. I went, um, you know, like, again, this was kind of like, I was 23, and I told myself I was just going to see what it was like. And I was born in Seoul, um, and I went to Busan because I, I was telling myself it wasn't about adoption, it was just, I just wanted to see what it was like. Um, and so I kind of put all of these barriers in between my desires and myself. Um, so, now I've kind of forgotten the question, but about my feelings growing up. Um, you know, my, my parents, you know, they had a good relationship and they did their best by me, but it was always like a, there's always some part of, uh, there was always some part of me that was, felt out of place and felt like I didn't have access to, I mean, obviously I didn't have access to things that other people had. And then, because that was a part of me, you know, like the, the thing that I needed access to was me, um, was very disorienting. Um, you know, and that's not all adoption, a lot of it's kind of race and other things, but all of that kind of contributed to this, this feeling that I had to either, it's like, I was talking to an adoptive friend the other, the other day about this, and she said, it was, it's, you have to politicize a guy. Politicize the guy. And that's kind of what it felt like. That like it was it was like death almost, right? Um, it was like facing death. Um, so it wasn't a great feeling, I guess. But it was you know, formative. It was what it was. Uh, in the book T and like in the end, why <laughs> can I say that? <laughs> So apparently in the book, the T, all along, he thought he was adopted, uh -huh. but actually... Oh yeah, you're really going to swear. I'm <laughs> so going to say, am I not supposed to No, no, no. Then maybe I can ask you later <laughs> if I'm spoiled. <laughs> Give it away, big plot threads. <laughs> I should do that? No, go ahead, I, ask the question. I know what you're talking about, Iris, so you can just... Ask the question. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, no, maybe I'm going to ask you later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure bad. Sure. But anyway, so I'm not going to ask that question. But the, the point I want to make, actually, I like the book because maybe, um, so I read uh, uh, some books written by Korean author who was adopted uh -huh. or for as uh, I'm, I'm Korean, so as a Korean, I read the books by just Korean author who live in America. Oh, so okay. have that yeah. all second, like a uh, Chang Dae Ri. Oh, so okay, he's yeah, touching sure. all this living in Korea and <coughs> second generation of Korean. Have yeah. First generation, Korea, they have Korean parents and then the growing up in America. Oh. Because I'm, you know, I raised my kid here as, and. So not, I think it's some part is not only adopted right, the yeah, person's yeah. problem, it's probably the second generation mm -hmm. Korean 
I can kind of see that. But because you put the background is Prague, that's why it was really intriguing. Be they usually all those uh, stories is background is America or it's like uh, searching their route in Korea. Right, yeah. But because you put your you put yourself in T, t is in Prague mm -hmm. and still using that myth in in uh, Check me. The T is resolving his situation as an adopted, growing up in America. So yeah. that's really good, you know, the intriguing point. And I, I like. It's different. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, you know, when I was, you know, in pitching the book or writing the book, I, I kind of thought of it as in the tradition of Americans in Europe, right? Or, Abroad, you know, um, Henry Miller or something, right? Uh, but nobody else seemed to see it that way, right? And that's like, I mean, I don't know if that says more about me or about publishing, but um, so I had that resistance that that it was different, you know, than the kind of um, the tropes that we see in in Asian American fiction and in adopt maybe especially in a, in adoptee fiction or transracial adoptee. Not that there's much of it anyway. Like this is um, one of the things that happened was when I, right before the book was going to come out, I started asking if anybody, for some reason I waited until the very last minute to ask like, does anybody know any novels by Korean American adoptees about Korean American adoptees? And nobody knew any, none. And so I don't know, I might be the only one. People were saying there's some from European, yeah, Europeans, but yeah, you know, and that uh, most of it is not fiction, right? There's a lot of memoir, there's some poetry, um, but it just was kind of something different, and I was very lucky to have an editor who is interested in, in, in things that are different, right? And kind of stories that um, don't fit in our already established publishing model. Watch the Olympics, and it was interesting to see, you know, just the way that the Olympics makes you talk about people and, and countries. It's, it's an odd thing. I never thought about how odd it was before until my daughter said, like, "Oh, the Americans are way better than the Chinese." Like, what? Where's she getting this idea from? And it's like just really, actually, she's talking about a very specific like race that they're running. But it's just, it's, and then you start thinking, if this is influencing the way that we talk, right? That is. It's clearly influencing the way that we think, and how does like the way that we watch the Olympics then kind of reinforce or, or you know, shape the stories we tell each other? You know, it's fascinating. It's a little disturbing, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, there's a lot of uh, uh, parallels. I mean, with the first, second generation, um, but then also you know, being being mixed. Um, you know, my mom when she was with me when, when I was just a kid, they'd go to the grocery store and standing in the line and people would ask, "How long have you had him?" Yeah. You know, like as if you know, was adopted. And my kids don't look like me, and I get the same question. Ew, wow. And um, you know, so the, there's a there's a number of ways that the way you've written this story about adoption it really it, it intersects so many of these really you know crucial uh, identities in in Asian America. Yeah. The, was that was the, were you thinking about those things? Sometimes I feel you know, especially before I get a lot of other adoptees. I, I felt like the, the kind of mixed experience or the help out experience was, was most similar to mine in, in yeah. some ways. Um, so I do think of that and, and that when you, you know, as a writer thinking about audience, I feel like that's an audience, you know. Uh, the, the, the memoir I wrote, I'm very comfortable. The memoir I wrote was called A Comfortable Boy. Uh -huh. And it ends in eighth grade and I'm in safety control. But not a day in my life goes past without somebody asking me, where are you from? Uh -huh. And you get, you get defined by those people outside of you. Right. And it, so it's not simply adoption, it's not, it's all across the country. It never, ever stops. <laughs> and people are very nice, but the next thing would be, well, you still have your accent, why do you still have your accent? You know, and you just have to say, but it goes on. Yeah. It, and I don't resent it because I'm comfortable, I, you know, but I just, sometimes I want to say hi. But the other thing <laughs> I say is, that once I was on an airplane flying to Birmingham, Alabama, and the stewardess was sunk, and she came up to me and she said, is this your first time in the South? So she <laughs> thought I was from somewhere else too. It just, it never ends. No, I mean, I, in some ways, it's like an experience for me going to Korea. Yeah, just right, like I'm just if they're just looking at me, I can't tell. But no, I mean, yeah. my mouth. It's but then it's different. I think when like it's a it's based on just how you look, you know, right? Like before you talk, you know. Um, but I've had that experience too. I, I went to this writing conference a couple of years ago, um, and we had this Korean American writer on Facebook group. Um, so a bunch of us went to get drinks at this hotel, and we had all ordered what we were going to have. And, and after that, the waiter asked, is this your first time in America? And we were, it's, it's just like this very odd thing, like you just heard all of our letters. The, 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 the kind of, the accent wasn't even playing into it, right? It was just, just what we looked like. You know, it's, it's weird. It's weird thing. You, you can't be far off the track. Right? It's just fine. <laughs> Eventually what comes out is 
the story that that they've been told by other family members, mm -hmm. and uh, most of the map is uh, is kind of a fiction. Mm -hmm. And but nevertheless, those are the stories that are told in those families about where they come from and why they left and where they're going. Yeah. And so even when the past is directly accessible yeah. to them, they're still going to these mythologies and these, these fictions. They're so powerful. Yeah. Right. Right. To break the mythology is to break who you are. Right? Yeah. You know, I mean, facts are just facts, as we, right. as we know. <laughs> now, facts are, facts are nothing, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I always, interested to see how much it blows, because I teach Asian American studies in it, it always blows my students' minds to know like that Asians have been in this country for so long and like have undergone so many of the challenges there. You know, like the same things are still happening today. It's just you can just watch them and their their heads are like, what? You know, it's really it's yeah, we don't know the mystery of it. We know the myths, yeah, we know the mystery of our those stories are in all the books I've written, I labored not to write anything about my children that would make them gas <laughs> when they got to 40. <laughs> they say, oh no. You know, because you don't want to pass that on to family members. So I kept, I, I still just be careful when I wrote about it, to write things that would never embarrass them or shame them. Because those are the stories. Those are all those stories. Right, yeah, yeah. You know, I wrote this column for a long time about my family and the bad luck that we uh, are constantly dealing with. And um, at a certain point, my wife's like, I don't want you to write about me anymore. And I was like, well, you're kind of like the main, you're the main character of this story. <laughs> you know? So I, but I, I had to stop, you know, I had to kind of, but I always felt like, you know, at heart, the, the kind of bubbling fool of the story was me, that I was the one who was kind of fool of this bad luck. And, but she, you know, but she thought it was it, it was her, right? Which, you know, it's hard to tell when people are going to see themselves. In the way way out of that is to have the person say things that he or she doesn't say. <laughs> just I, straight up. I, yeah, 